New York State Controller Tom DiNapoli paid a visit here to the North Country this week. Part of the uh, Saranac River Trail is a, uh, uh, a regional effort to connect uh, Peace Point Park up uh, to Saranac area. He toured downtown Plattsburgh with Mayor Chris Rosenquist, visiting the new Betty Little Arts Park as part of the Downtown Revitalization Initiative and the Saranac River Trail, which the mayor is hoping to extend onto the waterfront at Harbor Sign. Controller DiNapoli also walked the part of Margaret Street that the city is looking to redesign and renovate in the coming months. Then met with the mayor at City Hall to talk about the projects and developments that the mayor is hoping to move ahead with over the next few years. And Tom DiNapoli joins us now. It's good to see you. Welcome back. It's been a while, Tom. It's great to be back with you. Let's talk a little bit about your trip to Plattsburgh this week. You toured the downtown, the new Betty Little Arts Park, and the rest of the DRI project that's uh, still undeveloped in parts and, and tied up in a bit of litigation. You visited the Saranac River Trail and the waterfront that the mayor is hoping to develop, and Margaret Street, which is going to undergo a, a major facelift. The city's finances in good shape for them to move ahead with development like yeah. this? I mean, certainly when you go back a couple of years ago, uh, we found the city of Plattsburgh to be in some level of fiscal stress as part of our monitoring system. And uh, over a period of years, we saw improvement. That improvement continues. Uh, so there's no d stress designation right now. That's good news. And the city of Plattsburgh, like so many of our cities and municipalities, are bene just as the state is, are benefiting from uh, the federal dollars that have been coming in. So, you know, to the extent that the city's finances are an important foundation for broader uh, development in the community, uh, it's a good time uh, for Plattsburgh. It was really exciting to see the work that's been done so far and to hear from the mayor about the plans for the future. And like so many other towns and cities across New York, working on infrastructure. Uh, Margaret Street, that a big part of yeah. that is that street hasn't been touched in half a century. and working to replace that infrastructure. Yeah, and it's not just that, you know, what, what, what people would see, you know, in terms of the roadbed, but it's what's underneath. Uh, and you've got uh, sewer lines, that the mayor indicated. And it's the same, it's interesting, that the same issue I saw in Lake Placid the day before, when they started digging as part of their effort, uh, the same date on the sewer pipe, 1903. So certainly an old infrastructure. But this is something we've talked about before in our reports from the controller's office. We are an older state with an aging infrastructure. We need to do a better job of planning and investing uh, in our infrastructure. And you know, the welcome news, uh, the federal government, besides the American Rescue Plan, some of that money, some localities have used for infrastructure, but the in Federal Infrastructure Act is billions of dollars that'll be coming into New York uh, now and into the future. And I should also remind your viewers, uh, they're going to have the chance to vote on the Environmental Bond Act that's going to be on the ballot this November, $4.2 billion of an Environmental Bond Act. And obviously, a big piece of that will be grants that will go to local communities for environmental infrastructure. So drinking water, wastewater, uh, open space, I mean, all those issues uh, that you know, here in Plattsburgh and in other communities in the North Country are very important issues. And flood mitigation, many yeah. communities looking at how the weather's changing with climate change and uh, needing to better prepare yeah. to guard against these bigger, more severe storms. That's a good point, because I think one of the big uh, uh, reasons for doing the Bond Act is to deal with the climate issue, both in terms of the impact that you appropriately described, but also to help the state meet our very ambitious goals uh, to deal with climate. For the most part, communities here in the North Country doing okay? Other than a few across the state financially, yeah, are they, they okay? You know, generally, when we've done our fiscal stress uh, the last go arounds, there are fewer communities, certainly in that level of significant fiscal stress. You know, look, I, I think part of that has to do with the fact that in, in uh, recent times, there's just been a lot more money coming in uh, to localities, both from Washington, uh, coronavirus relief money, then, you know, with the current administration, the American Rescue Plan, the infrastructure money and the state as well. You know, the state has benefited from the federal money that's come in, and the state has benefited from higher than expected revenues that have come in. And you certainly look at this year's state budget. It is the largest in, in the state's history, but a lot of that budget is money that goes back to localities, uh, be it municipalities, be it school districts. You know, we just had school budget voting this week, and generally speaking, uh, you saw school districts stay within the tax cap. By and large, sort of positive, you know, voter reaction to the school budgets, but you've also had historic increases in school aid. So, uh, when people sometimes are critical, oh, the state budget's getting too big. Well, you don't realize a lot of that state budget 
ends up going back to localities, that helps to reduce property taxes and helps our, our local officials implement their plans for quality of life initiatives in their own community. So much federal money coming in, yeah. though, do you raise the red flag? Do you raise the concerns that, yes, that money's nice now, but that money's going to be finite? That's, that's been our, our, our big concern and our, our, our mantra for many months now, that, there, that, that that money is not forever and we shouldn't spend it like it's forever. We're concerned about what we call the fiscal cliff as the money's spent down. You know, the expectation is that the economy will pick up and make up for, uh, you know, for the money that won't be there. You know, we're in a challenging time right now. We see that the, the stock market is very volatile, the impact of inflation, which many of the experts said would be a temporary blip, doesn't feel very temporary now. I saw, you know, just coming to the studio for $4.99 on gasoline, you know, people are feeling that and concerned about that. So, you know, we have to be mindful the federal money is not forever. It's one reason why in the state budget, I was glad that they significantly boosted the money put aside for rainy day reserve funds. We, sh we should have done more of that sooner. We should have done even in this year's budget more of it in the statutory, more restricted reserves, but they still put, put money aside in a way that we haven't done before. But the same thing goes for local governments. Be careful how you're planning. Do not make recurring spending commitments if you don't have recurring revenue to back it up. So, you know, we're, we're going to continue to, to look at um, how the state is dealing with that issue. We also have on our website, on the Office of State Controller website, feel free to Google and search it, a federal tracker looking at the different federal programs, how much money is coming into the state, how much money is uh, spent down. We're going to update that on a monthly basis because we really have to track this money as well. And at some point, whether it's the state or our local governments, we have to be accountable to Washington as well. They want to make sure we're spending the money as intended. So very important we keep track of, of this money. Yeah, and you talk about inflation, you talk about the market slumping. Is the Federal Reserve and, and the Biden administration doing enough to, 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 to deal with it, to tackle it? I'm sure if you ask the person on the street, they would say no, because they're not feeling it right now. Um, it's obviously a very complex issue, you know, and, and probably no easy solution in terms of turning it around. We, there are certain things not in our control. Obviously, the, uh, this horrendous war in Ukraine uh, that Russia unleashed upended markets, upended supply chain. We're feeling the consequence of that. We still have the hangover from COVID and what that did to supply chain, and that's a piece of it. Uh, you know, so some of it is not within certainly our control in the state, not even in control of Washington. But you know, the president has said, to his credit, that inflation is the number one issue that he's focused on now. Uh, to what extent the administration policy will coordinate with the Fed. You know, there is some level of independence and separation there. It's unclear. And obviously, as in interest rates start to go up, you know, that may start to slow infl inflation. It may have other negative consequences, though. What will it do to the real estate market? Uh, so there's a lot of uncertainty out there. Uh, and, you know, I certainly hope, I think we all hope, that, uh, that the leaders in Washington have, have a better handle on it now than they've had uh, because, um, you know, even if people are getting some salary increases, and, and some have, if, if those increases are being eaten away by inflation, you know, households are not going to feel that they're moving forward. So that's a concern. You know, but for now, people are spending money. You know, that's part of what's keeping the economy going is that people are willing to spend money. And we'll see as we come into the summer season, you know, even on the price of gasoline, will that um, hurt travel, tourism? Uh, remains to be seen. Maybe for New York, it'll mean that more New Yorkers, particularly downstaters, instead of going cross country, they're going to come right here to the North Country and spend time up here. Uh, that may be a, you know, a possible uh, positive dividend. Which they did during the pandemic and really helped Big the North time. Country. Well, as I said to you before we started, I, I was one of them. You know, I, I, I was up in, uh, no offense to Plattsburgh, but I was in Lake Placid. And uh, it was great because there weren't too many other places to go. And, you, you know, you look at the New York State map and, and there are many wonderful places to travel to in New York. but. I love the North Country, and I said, you know what? I'm going to head up there, and I had a great few days. The place was packed with downstaters, you know, uh, uh, and it was good to see. People were spending money, going to the restaurants, and, you know, we heard in Lake Placid, and I heard today in Plattsburgh, uh, which is different than some of the other communities, actually, you know, the certainly sales tax revenue stayed pretty strong through COVID because people were, you know, were coming here. I know the big concern, I'm, I'm hearing uh, a more positive uh, story right now is, you know, Canadian travel is very important to this part of the state and Canadian visitors. So that's starting to come back, you know, not back to where it was, but it is starting to come back. So that's good news for, for I know Gary Douglas from the chamber always mentions that and the importance of, of, uh, 
on our side and certainly on the Canadian side, people to be mindful of how important that is to both sides of the border. Uh, so hopefully as we head into the summer, I know there's some concern about where COVID numbers are at right now, but hopefully we will not go back to the kind of uh, severe restrictions that, that really put a, a limitation on that kind of uh, cross-border travel. So important to this part of the state. In your role as controller, you do audits, and two in particular you've done in the past year have gotten a lot of attention. Uh, most recently, you looked into the number of reported deaths in nursing homes across New York during the height of the pandemic, which has been a huge controversy. You found the number was in fact underreported by the Department of Health and the Cuomo administration. Yeah, and it really seemed that at the highest levels of state government, they were they knew that the numbers weren't being reported accurately, but it was you know clearly a deliberate attempt to make us look better than we were. But but I, I think what's important about that order, it also showed that the Department of Health wasn't prepared to do an accurate accounting for for what the situation was. We were behind other states, even in terms of surveying nursing homes, as was requested by the federal government. We didn't have enough staff to do that job to check the information, a lot of it's self-reported by nursing homes. You know, so you, you compare us to California, some of the other states, they, they, they just knew how to do a better job of accounting for all of this. And when they did get their handle on the correct numbers, as you say in your question, the correct numbers weren't getting out there to the public. So you still have many families that have been devastated by the loss and the, a feeling that, you know, some bad decisions were being made and, and worse that, you know, they, the, the, the truth wasn't coming out. And so part of what we said is that even with our assessment, we, we, we couldn't get a complete answer. I think it would be fair to say the Department of Health wasn't always so cooperative in giving us uh, information. We did the best we could. And, and I know for many of the families who lost loved ones during that terrible time, they still would say, like to see a more clear accounting for what happened. And then as the months went on, a circling of the wagons, if you will, uh, to try to keep the governor from looking bad. And obviously that had, um, severe consequences for the prior administration. And uh, there's still a lot of questions being raised. Uh, and, uh, you know, I hope we get some answers to those questions. Maybe some will never get a full, complete answer. But it was, you know, I think that disconnect that people feel, because there was a certain point in time where, where there was a sense New York was doing it better than anybody else. It, it was that perception was not always based on reality. The other report was last fall, the number of people in New York without access to reliable, affordable broadband, a million households, yeah. especially in rural areas. Does the infrastructure bill and this year's budget, New York State budget, uh, which dedicated a lot of funding, a billion dollars yeah. to try to fix that, uh, are those major steps forward to address this? Oh, I think so. And there's been more help coming from Washington as well, both in terms of direct dollars and, and money to help subsidize uh, people to have. Uh, access and availability. So it means a combination of factors. Part of it's the physical infrastructure. That's particularly true in rural communities. But for rural communities uh, and, and all communities across the state, income level is a key indicator of whether or not you're going to have access. So uh, I think between what uh, Albany's come up with and Washington, those are going to be major step forwards uh, for us to close the gap. And here in the North Country, you know, th this area has, this region has the highest percentage of people in the state without availability or access. So both, uh, you know, from a cost point of view and an infrastructure point of view, uh, I think this will be a real boost to the efforts to deal with this issue here in the North Country. Key to the economy, key to daily living, key to infrastructure, and certainly a lesson from the COVID time, uh, relying on internet and relying on broadband service, absolutely essential to our lives.